And let's start, um, if I can get it to work, there we are. Uh, let's start by going back in time uh, a little bit, pre-COVID, pre-Brexit, pre-Boris to uh, 2017. Uh, when under Theresa May, the, uh, the government became interested once again uh, in design quality. Uh, and at that time, we just published uh, an earlier report that uh, you referred to, Katia, uh, on design skills in English local authorities, which concluded that urban design skills are woefully low and declining, uh, and critical gaps exist within local planning authorities, including the ability to produce proactive design guidance in-house. Since then, uh, and as demonstrated through the various announcements on Tuesday, design quality has increasingly come back onto the national agenda. And the aspirations are now clear to move from uh, substandard places uh, to high quality, beautiful and sustainable buildings and places. But of course the reality, as the housing uh, design audit revealed is too often still substandard. Importantly, the audit also revealed that those local authorities that engage most directly in design uh, are also those that are delivering the best quality outcomes in terms of urban design quality. So design capacity in local planning authorities really does matter. So where are we now in uh, 2021 um, and how have design skills in local planning uh, authorities changed during this period uh, since uh, 2017 of heightened uh, national ambition on this front? To investigate, uh, we used a freedom of information uh, request to all 322 uh, local planning authorities uh, and after some cajoling, uh, we got a 71% response rate, so a very high response rate, and a big thanks to all of those uh, who responded to the survey, as well as to my colleague uh, Valentina Giordano for all her great work in uh, putting together the survey and ensuring such a great response rate. The survey itself uh, comes in five parts. Uh, covering in-house capacity, change over time and recruitment, design review and design codes, community engagement in design and design guidance training and champions. And uh, I'll use that structure to structure my presentation and forgive me, I'll be throwing quite a few figures uh, your way, but hopefully some clear messages too. We started by asking what in-house design skills do you uh, currently have? And the good news is that nationally, the numbers of urban designers and architects uh, in local planning authorities has stabilized, um, although the availability of landscape expertise continues to decline. The bad news is that today, two fifths of local planning authorities still have no access at all to any uh, design advice, um, any, any urban design advice, two thirds uh, no access to any landscape uh, advice, and three quarters uh, to no access to any urban architectural advice. So we asked if you don't have any in-house capacity, how do you cover these skills requirements? And the first point to make uh, here uh, is um, well made in uh, a quote um, that uh, even the headline figures hide the true extent of the deficit, given the increase, increased sharing of posts, uh, the use of temporary staff, and the coverage of design by non-specialists. There's also a significant increase in the use of external consultants and agency staff to try and fill the gaps, with two fifths of local authorities attempting to do this. And design review is often also seen as a means of filling design skills gaps rather than a means of supplementing and supporting in-house design capacity that already exists. The use of consultants, either on behalf of local authorities or, or, or sort of uh, by developers, rises to 60% in relation to the production of proactive design guidance and frameworks, and to 70% in relation to the preparation of design codes. 
And this is of significant concern to local authorities for uh, whom a general feeling existed uh, echoed uh, in this comment that the local knowledge of in-house staff is invaluable and much more cost effective than using consultants, despite the fact that, of course, we have many brilliant consultants. Now, when we asked about how in-house capacity had changed, uh, we saw a very slight uh, increase in capacity nationally. Uh, if we spread the design specialists working in local planning authorities evenly across the country, uh, then in 2017, we had 1.6 uh, urban designers per authority. Uh, and now we have 1.7. Um, put it another way, in that time, in that period, we have just 30 rather funky looking new uh, design staff uh, spread across all the local authorities in the country. And because most of these are in the few local authorities that already have larger design teams, in fact, only 10 local authorities now have design expertise when previously, uh, in our previous survey, they did not. At this rate of change, it will take until 2077 for every local authority in England to have access to some in-house design expertise. So whilst a minority of local authorities have made a strategic investment in creating a place quality team, the survey revealed that many authorities are unable to do so because of funding difficulties. In this context, authorities overwhelmingly describe recruitment of urban design staff as also very challenging, particularly with regard to their ability to compete with the private sector. Next, we asked uh, about the use of temporary staff to help fill gaps. And authorities told us that uh, whilst the employment of temporary staff can help to smooth bumps in workload, on the whole, authorities would prefer to build their own capacity uh, and with it continuity in knowledge and experience in-house. One respondent put it particularly well, uh, continuity of knowledge is hugely valuable for local authorities, but undervalued as it's not represented on a spreadsheet. We asked next about the two tools of urban design governance that, most, that were most strongly associated in the housing design audit with better quality design, up, design outcomes, namely design codes and the use of design review. We found that uh, the use of design review continues to rise and national coverage to improve, although still only a quarter use design review regularly, meaning at least quarterly, whilst two fifths uh, never uh, or only very rarely use design review. It seems that uh, a lack of awareness still persists about the value of design review to improve design quality outcomes and particular, particularly over its potential to be cost neutral to local authorities. Mapping practices across England nevertheless reveals uh, a more comprehensive national picture of authorities using design review panels than in 2017, although also a geographical uh, 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 uneven spread, if you like. Uh, so few places outside of London and parts of the Southeast use design review regularly, meaning uh, at least quarterly. More often design review is used intermittently. That's all those places that you can see in orange. And notable absences in the use of design review persist through large parts of the East, Northwest, swathes of the South and Southwest and across the West Midlands. Interestingly, uh, the increased uh, amount of review overall has been accompanied by a decline in the number of internally managed panels, uh, those panels managed within local authorities themselves, in favour of externally managed panels uh, and these now account for two thirds of design review. Turning to design codes very much in, uh, on the national agenda at the moment, as we know, the use of design codes has also continued to rise with three quarters of local authorities now having at least some experience of their use. Uh, although most local authorities who use them either require or encourage uh, developers 
to produce codes, with only 14% produced uh, in-house, a relatively small number of codes actually produced within local authorities themselves. This time mapping the use of design codes across the country shows a widespread distribution in their use with notable concentrations of non-use uh, to the south of London and in parts of the East and the West Midlands. When asked about their likely future practices in light of the new requirement that local authorities should have design codes in place, one third plan to produce design codes in-house, so that's quite an increase on current practice, uh, perhaps reflecting the dissatisfaction, uh, dissatisfaction that many noted with developer-produced codes. A much smaller number intend to use consultants, um, and a third don't know how they're going to produce or, or fund uh, design codes, particularly if they're required to produce them for their whole local authority area. Interestingly, over half of, of authorities anticipate producing codes uh, only for key sites or areas of change and less than a third for their entire local authority area. And this, this quote, I think, reflects the concerns of many on that front. Uh, we do not completely agree that blanket design codes are the right approach when there are great uh, variations in the physical, socioeconomic and cultural landscape of a place. Turning to community engagement in design, another major theme of the recent planning white paper, uh, today about two thirds of all local authorities use or require local consultation events uh, on major developments, um, but more proactive hands-on engagement in the actual design of development drops off sharply to about a fifth of local authorities using those methods for some sites. On a related concern in the white paper, uh, beyond the use of social media, there's very little evidence of technological approaches being used to encourage a more fundamental engagement of communities in design. Uh, there are, of course, a few notable exceptions. Uh, this uh, authority, for example, plans uh, 3D immersive engagement through a digital model of their whole borough, but there was very, uh, uh, very few examples of such tools being used. More commonly, authorities report being too stretched to, in delivering their sort of minimum statutory duties to take on community engagement in any fundamental role themselves. Instead, typically they look to developers to conduct local consultation events uh, and any hands-on engagement in design. And a very simple message uh, was very widely apparent in the survey that more engagement with the public will require more resources. Coming to the final area we looked at, the use of guidance and training, um, following the cull uh, in 2012 of uh, national guidance, uh, the important role of uh, government in producing such materials has now been firmly re-established and the new and a few old nationally produced guides uh, on design are seen as are playing an important role in guiding local decision-making once again. Actually, this marked quite a change from the 2017 survey where very few local authorities seem to be using even the old design guides that existed at that time. In addition, almost three quarters of local authorities use some form of local design guidance of various types in uh, their decision-making, sometimes shared across different local authority areas. On training, uh, budget cuts are still eating into training budgets with most design related training focused on raising awareness about design quality rather than on developing new design skills. Uh, for their part, councillors receive some informal training on design in just over half of local authorities, but it's typically very basic indeed. Uh, and finally, only a small percentage of councils have a designated design or place champion to promote design quality across the authority at large. Although positively, those that do strongly recommend such roles as key to help build a sort of corporate commitment to quality and generally a culture of good design. So to conclude, like all good reports, we finish this one with some recommendations. Uh, some of which we might uh, come back to in the discussion if we have time. Um, first, for government, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of these, I'll just uh, select a few. 
Um, the uh, first one is the need to establish a new dedicated and generous funding stream for raising design skills in local planning authorities. And receipt of this funding should be tied to local authorities themselves submitting a plan for resourcing in-house design expertise over the long term. Government in the past has uh, had dedicated funds for design skills, but it's tended to be fairly small and time limited. And as soon as the, the funding runs out, the, the posts seem to go with them. Uh, uh, we've just seen an amendment to the National Planning Policy Framework. Uh, it's a shame it didn't include this, which is uh, a policy to uh, make early and independent design review mandatory for all major developments. Uh, we've seen overwhelming evidence that design review really does make a, a, a positive improvement in design and should be far more stressed in government guidance and policy. And as part of the government's levelling up agenda, uh, the government should consider a light touch fund for the conduct of design review and the preparation of design go codes beyond the current pilot program in those parts of the country where practices are least developed and there are quite a few holes in the country where there's, there's very few design codes or design review being used at all. Some recommendations for the brand new office uh, for place uh, launched just uh, on Tuesday. Um, they should consider st establishing a proactive enabling function that will reach out to local planning authorities and assist them directly in the production and or commissioning of design codes in-house. Joanna Averley, our, 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 who we'll hear from soon, uh, managed a, brilliantly managed uh, a, a similar service back in the old days of CABE, which had incredible impacts, and we should consider having such an, enab an enabling service back again. Um, second, might think about establishing a national charrette program through which effective but efficient methods of engaging communities in design are developed uh, and promoted. There's really no substitute for engaging communities directly into, in design if we, if we want to know what they think about uh, design quality. And a program of executive level training for chief officers, chief executives and leaders of councils should be devised, focused on culture change and local leadership relating to place quality. It's all about that culture of quality and that needs to come from the top. And then last but definitely not least for local government, fundamentally all local authorities should invest in in-house design expertise appropriate to the size of their planning team with a remit to prepare or commission design frameworks codes and guidance conduct or commission design review and community engagement offer advice to planning staff on all major developments implement government guidance on design and generally raise and support local design quality ambitions and to do that we recommend the ratio of design specialist staff to other professional planning staff of one to 10 is a reasonable aspiration to work to. And then finally, consider establishing local, uh, establishing local community panels to engage citizens in an ongoing conversation about design quality beyond the usual suspects who get involved in, in these issues. So that's all from me. Thank you very much uh, to listening to me. If you want to download the, the, uh, the report in its full glory, then if you go to placealliance.org.uk, you can do that there. Thank you very much. Back to Kaki.